Um, I wanted to summarize the evidence right now that we have that um, that it's airborne, but I wanted to start with this slide, which is a great illustration from my colleague Yugo Lee in Hong Kong, describing what happens when you talk, breathe, cough, sneeze, sing. Uh, you generate a big cloud of aerosols, respiratory aerosols, and they're all different sizes, and depending on the size, they'll drop out of the air, which we call droplets, or they will be transported into the environment. What we also like to try to delineate where they end up by the terms short range airborne route, which means oh, we're pretty close to the person who emitted this cloud of aerosol and it's a short range air transportation transmission and we inhale the particles. Long range transmission means the particles are staying aloft for a long time and they may be transmitted to people in way other parts of the space or even through the HVAC system. Um, we are now seeing a, a new phenomenon with the SARS-CoV, which I'll talk about here. Um, we've seen a lot of data coming out in rapid fashion showing that it can be detected in the air. It's found in a hospital patient room in Wuhan. The toilet area is particularly um, was noted because there's no ventilation in the toilet area and also where medical staff removed their PPE thinking that perhaps there was some resuspension from the floors. Um, they also detected some moderate concentrations in crowded areas of hospital and department store uh, with a 15 minute exposure would lead to inhaling one copy of viral DNA and most of them are PM 2.5 or in, in respirable. It was also detected on the surface air of an outlet fan indicating airborne presence. In Nebraska, they did a really nice study showing significant viral DNA RNA in air and personal samples and were also able to culture one of these. Uh, we've also known that SARS-CoV-1, the predecessor to two, was spread through the air, through airplanes, hospitals, and apartment buildings, so it's not really a surprise. There's compelling evidence to show that significant transmission is really occurring in crowded, poorly ventilated spaces, which I really want to point out, especially for this crew, because you have such a good understanding of how to control ventilation and how to make ventilate, how to ventilate well spaces. Uh, so there's been clusters in Japan on um, poorly ventilated spaces, um, in ski towns, you know, it's out of control here in Colorado, in ski towns. Um, and in Idaho, it's been really high. There's a story in the New Yorker about a gondola transmission. We know about the church clusters, especially in Washington State. Um, and then a new study came out with three family clusters in an air-conditioned restaurant in China. I'll show you a diagram of that, which is quite interesting. We know that ordinary speech aerosolizes a lot of respiratory particles, and some people are actually super emitters. So with a super emitter, if you talk to them for 10 minutes, they will generate a cloud of 6,000 aerosol particles, excuse me for the typo. Uh, and we know that the short range airborne route dominates during talking and coughing, especially within two meters. And the large droplet only dominates exposure when the droplets are greater than 100 microns and within 2.2 uh, .2 meters while talking. So this is um, a, a clear indication that social distancing and physical distancing is really, really key. Here's the picture of the restaurant. Uh, we don't know as much about the air conditioning system as we would like, but this is the diagram that came out of the paper showing there was five tables in this small third floor restaurant in China and an air conditioner was blowing and um, recirculating cooling air. I kind of think it was probably an in-room air cleaner that's just um, put on the wall to cool the air internal. And so as it's recirculating the air to cool it, there is transmission occurring here. Um, table A did not know table B or table C, and yet the transmission occurred to all these cases with A1 being the index case. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about the half-life. You've probably hopefully seen this data, but it's important to know in case you're going out and getting groceries or you've got to get mail or packages, what do you do with all of that stuff? How long does it last? Uh, we know the half-life for cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic is between four and seven hours, which means 
you know, after 24 hours, your cardboard will um, have no viability. Plastic is much longer. Um, and here's the aerosol information, which shows you that aerosol actually of COVID-2, which is the red, is, um, you know, it's staying viable for over three hours in the air. And the half-life of the viability of the aerosol is about an hour here. So just knowing that um, is, is an important data point. I just threw in some slides about virus viability versus relative humidity. I think the better term will be absolute humidity, and I'd love to see some studies on that. We find that as relative humidity goes up, the uh, viability goes down. So that means, you know, as we get higher relative humidity, we'll see um, decrease in virus viability. Uh, I think that's probably all I want to say on that. So some evidence-based airborne infectious disease controls, including masks. We've, there's a lot out there about masks. Um, clearly washing hands with soap, it's an enveloped virus, so it works well. Filtration is an, also an obvious um, airborne infectious disease control. We really think increasing your ventilation is key. And so I think as we go forward, we really need to redesign how we do buildings and spaces and ventilation because these poorly ventilated spaces are what's really driving the transmission. Um, and then I'm an ultraviolet dermocidal light expert and I think upper room UV is a, could be a really useful technology in places where we can't get more outside air ventilation, but we really need to increase the air changes. Um, so I might just stop there and, you know, see if there's any questions or talk, talk about the, what we are, what I just went over right now on, on this particular material, then we can go on. Any questions out there you want to talk about with this particular talk? May I? Hello, this is Juan Levy. Can Hello. I yeah. Unmute it. Um, Shelly, you said about uh, relative humidity versus absolute humidity. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, it came up in a, a teleconference call today. I'm not um, the relative humidity expert, but it came up today when we were discussing uh, the influence of relative humidity. Some data out of China was showing an interesting relationship between cases and relative humidity. and in the building science community, we decided that really the best uh, measure could be absolute humidity because we'd prefer to know the absolute amount of water in the atmosphere. And that may be a better indication of, you know, transmission and viability. So we were hoping that we could see more studies reporting absolute humidity. And that's about all I got, got on that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Shelly, I'm curious if you could uh, kind of characterize, just given that we kind of had a little bit more of a wider spread of folks on the call tonight throughout the industry, but you know, characterize um, how or, or how might passive house be different from say typical buildings? Like how does air tightness, for example, impact the controllability of air quality, even, even maybe you know, things that have to be mitigated, but like what are the, some of the differences between a code level building of air infiltration and when we build a super tight envelope like we do in Passive House? Yeah, I mean, really good question. I think the key parameter is the overall outside air exchange rate. And we see in well ventilated, I'm just gonna start with a hospital. We see in well ventilated hospitals, uh, not a lot of airborne uh, virus and not a lot of transmission and hospitals are supposed to provide 12 air changes per hour outside air so six air changes outside air uh, and then add it on to another six depending on what the application of the room is or if you can up it with filtration or UV which is a lot of air change you know so uh, what's a typical air change in a passive house that you aim for <laughs> Half, 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 a, yeah. half an air change an hour. None, half, is half that what you say? <laughs> what? No, we're looking at like a standard rate is about what, uh, half, yeah, 
Yeah, roughly half an air change an yeah. hour through the house. Yeah, so, it's so much, much more half an air change an hour is actually <clears throat> higher than a typical U.S. home rate. You know, they're a little, lot lower because they just rely on infiltration. Uh, but I think that that is not nearly enough air change when you have, you know, a, a lot of people in your space and one person might be infectious. Um, so thinking about fresh air uh, supply and where we should be supplying it and where the people are is, I think, what we need to be shifting towards. For example, I think bedrooms and passive houses are underventilated. Uh, we find an accumulation of carbon dioxide overnight in bedrooms. People are sleeping, they're small, there's no, no, no real outdoor air supply usually. Um, and so, you know, that's, a, that's an example of where we would need to add outside air. Mm -hmm. I, um, hi, Shelly, it's nice to see you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think at some point we have to take the conversation from simply saying more ventilation, and we understand where that's coming from, to assessing the quality of the ventilation and the source of the pollutant. And yeah, I think I, I so I'm going to attempt to restate what you're saying, and you can disagree with me and tell me I'm wrong. Um, I mean, I think many passive house buildings or good high performance buildings do a good job of ventilating the entire space. There's supply and exhaust from critical rooms. There's a cascade of air through the same place. So you get even ventilation across the whole building. And in a non point source problem, like you don't have something really uh, toxic on the kitchen stove or you don't have somebody with a disease in your house, um, that can be really effective. I think where this breaks down and the hospital is a good example is where you know you have something cooking on the stove that can create a lot of emissions or a sick person in the space or a potentially sick person in the space and that rate that was adequate for health in other circumstances because it was fairly even suddenly is no longer adequate is yeah. that a fair attempt to summary summarize that i think um, that's a really a really nice way of restating it you know and and uh and you can up the, yeah, so say, so one of the recommendations is if you're taking care of an infectious person in your home to put them, you know, isolated in a bedroom, but then to add as much technology or controls as you can. So add a really high efficiency air cleaner, run your exhaust fan, open your windows, you know, anything to try to contain that space and, and change the air somehow. Um, but I, if, you, if you don't mind, I think this is a perfect segue into my other piece I want to share with you, which is, which is our home infiltration and health study, which really did try to link, you know, what's the quality of air coming into your house and what kinds of health effects do you see because of the quality of the air? I think that's a really admirable piece about passive houses. You try to maintain really high quality air coming into your house. Uh, whereas, you know, most residences don't do anything about that because it's all about infiltration. Um, so I might just go ahead and um, go ahead and start there. And also, I just guess for context is that here in the West, at least, almost everything is forced air systems for heating and cooling. So recirculation of air is pretty much the standard with filters that are designed mostly to protect the motors of the HVAC system rather than the inhabitants of the house. So that's kind yeah. of our background, right? Yeah, that's right. So we did this study uh, looking at low-income housing in the Denver area. We were asking the question, we, we originally started asking the question of if you do weatherization of homes to reduce energy bills and to increase energy efficiency of homes, what happens when you're living in that space? Is there, are there health effects? because the traditional in the indoor air quality space has been oh my goodness we can't tighten buildings because then we'll contain air pollution and that is generated indoors and will create sick buildings and that was shown in the 1970s to in fact be the case um, and so what the question was well is that going to be happening now in the context of climate change and energy conservation and these weatherization programs that the department of energy has been funding 
So we looked at low income communities because they're at higher risk for health effects and they are also subsidized to get their house, house weatherized by DOE and the state. So we got to recruit about 200 homes by mail and these are where the homes all ended up being in not only up in Fort Collins, but out here in East Denver. We then went into each home for two hours and then did a blower door test to uh, measure the air tightness and then figure out the infiltration rate from, the, from that measurement. We did a home characterization walkthrough and we did a bunch of respiratory assessments, including questionnaires and lung function testing, which is to understand how much volume and, a, and healthy, healthy is your lungs. What's interesting about this study, which is fairly unique, is we, we have an objective measurement of lung function and a subjective measurement, with, which is your self-reported questionnaire in, information, which becomes relevant in, in a, a later context. So with, with regards to the ener energy efficiency, uh, we, we, did not, we were not allowed to get the data of what happened in the weatherization from the Colorado Energy Office. They refused to work with us, unfortunately. So we had to go through the homes and just observe what we thought was what happening in the house. So we gave everybody a point for all of these uh, five energy efficiency retrofits that we observed in the home. And we then found, well, I guess this made us somewhat confident in that if we had more energy efficiency retrofits, then we would have a decreasing uh, infiltration rate from, or the house would become somewhat tighter in our blower door test. Um, and remember, these are all, you know, regular homes in, of which we have, you know, so many more of those in Denver and then low income to that you add on top of that. What's interesting is it turns out that the two most important energy retrofits that we observed in terms of tightening a home was window weather stripping and air handler ductwork sealing. And this was doing logistic regression on our data. We also found that the data showed, you know, really these homes are very leaky and it doesn't actually matter whether they have been weatherized or not by the weatherization programs because they all were still pretty leaky. We did have some built green homes in Boulder with the Boulder Housing Partners and also Habitat for Humanity and they did have uh, lower air um, infiltration rates. However, what's also um, makes sense from a building perspective is that when you put in all the variables that are important in a building, we found that, you know, the age and the volume of the building was way more important in terms of infiltration than any energy efficiency retrofits you did. So, you know, when you built your house and how big is it is, is key to how, how much infiltration and leaky it is. Uh, then we went to the, this is the health data, and I only have two slides on this, and I'll be happy to talk about it more, but what we ended up dis determining is that if you look on the x-axis, these are odds ratios, which is how we determine health effects in, in one type of study, where we, you know, this is the odds of you having a cough, and as you're infiltration rate, your annual average infiltration rate, I call it infiltration because blower door tests are measuring infiltration, not ventilation with open windows and what have you. As you increase your infiltration rate, your, your odds of having a cough goes up, your medication for wheeze goes up, your dry cough at night goes up, etc. And this was really a bit of a surprise to us, meaning as the leakier your home is, the more respiratory symptoms you report. Uh, so we thought, well, maybe that's because the air quality that's coming into the home is bad because people are expo exposed to traffic. So we stratified our data, and indeed what we found are those people who lived within 200 meters of a roadway were more exposed to traffic-related air pollution and had more symptoms. So here what this is indicating to us is that it's the quality of the air that's really important 
uh, when you ventilate your home. And if you're ventilating your home with traffic related air pollution, then you're gonna impact your health. Um, the people in our sample were, everybody who participated in our study could fill out these surveys. When we go to the lung function testing, I know these are health data and can be, need, needs to take some time to digest. But what we found was that the, uh, the opposite happened with the objective lung function test. So a lung function test is very difficult to do if you've ever done one before. And you have to blow really hard into this device and then measure the volume that your lung can hold. Many people who have lung disease or have just been ill or are older cannot do this maneuver. So what we found out here in this particular data set was that the um, air, air changes um, because of infiltration uh, was significant when, when you had um, lower air changes, you had better lung function. And um, so this was kind of an interesting result, meaning, let's see, did I get that right? Because it's so confusing, sometimes I don't get it right. <laughs> so actually, no, I, I said it wrong. If you have more infiltration, you have better lung function in this particular case, whereas in the other data, you had worse lung symptoms with more infiltration. Um, so at the very high um, quartile, you had good lung function. It's explained a little bit better on this paper, on this, um, which we find that spirometry is a more acute objective measure of lung function health, and you have to be pretty healthy. So we generally need more outside air when we're healthy, but when we're not healthy and we bring in toxic air, then it really affects our health. So I'm gonna stop there and see if I need to clarify that further and talk about it with you. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. I was just gonna say is that uh, when you talk about infiltration, it's uncontrolled infiltration, right? So yeah. this is air that's going through your wall system, coming from however it comes. So um, could there be a point where there's like also conditions between the outside and the inside? the air is traveling through that also affects mold or things like that as well. Because it also brings in lots of moisture too. There's all these other kind of compounding issues that happen when these buildings are not controlled, so. Yeah, and another, one of my colleagues has done a study showing that when you pull air through building walls, you can often get a lot of formaldehyde. Hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a, a terminology thing that's, confusing this slightly, and this happens all the time in building science, is that we use air changes an hour to measure both infiltration and mechanical ventilation. And you need to be really clear when you're talking about air leakage, which often can bring unhealthy air, not all circumstances, versus when you're talking about mechanical air changes, like in a hospital where you're trying to do high air changes an hour. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, air changes is kind of, I think of the air, air changes per hour is just the unit you're using. Yeah, it's just a unit, but it, this, this confusion happens oddly enough all the time. It's amazing how often in life we stumble over this same piece. Yeah, you have to be really clear where the air is coming from, don't you? Yeah. And yeah, I'd, I'd actually love to see more studies or more links to this question about what the outdoor air quality is like. Um, we see this clearly in cities like Vancouver, where unfortunately the zoning pattern has put all the multi-unit housing on the arterial roads. So almost by definition, if you get a new apartment, you've cut years off your life because you're living next to a highway by virtue of the fact you're living in a new apartment. Um, where there's not good guidance on what kind of defensive measures we could take on that, what kind of filtration would actually be effective long-term for that. And then we now have almost every summer these smoke events Mm -hmm. um, where it doesn't matter where you live, you've got this huge amount of outdoor air issues. And the principle of building science for so long has been that, you know, more outside air is healthier until the outside air is not healthy. And that's, that's where I kind of, our, our kind of core principles are in question, at least some of the time in some locations. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I way back when, when in summertime here, we would get the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment doing these public health announcements saying, it's wildfire season. When there's a wildfire, open your windows. And I kept thinking, that just sounds wrong. So we did a study looking at the efficacy of, oh no, I'm sorry, they say close your windows. Close your windows, right. Yeah, sorry, yeah, close your windows. And when there's a wildfire, and I thought, well, that just doesn't seem all that great. Um, I'm a I'm a filtration person as well. So we did a study looking at how effective using an air cleaner was versus closing your windows. And we found that closing your windows only reduces the PM infiltration by 50%, but using an air cleaner that's appropriately sized for your space can reduce it up to 80 to 90%. Back, back to the COV question, unless somebody else wanted to go there. I don't want to interrupt anyone. There's um, one more question related actually to the, the wood, the smoke events, because we noticed in our, our architectural practice about two years ago that all of a sudden clients had this new value or something that they were concerned about in programming, which was air tightness. And it was great from a passive house perspective, because that's something that we're already delivering in terms of them being feeling like they had more control over the quality of the internal part of their home. And initially it had been clients that had other environmental sensitivities, whether it be, you know, seasonal allergies, asthma, um, and being attracted to the acoustic properties. So, you know, just now people start to think about this in terms of smoke. And I'm curious to find out if you think it's uh, sort of a reliable thing to talk about in terms of indoor air quality when we have Say airborne illness outside. I don't know if it's something that you have any kind of specific opinion about, but I'm curious. I think I think it's something you could definitely talk about. If you have, you know, one of the selling points of a passive house is that it's um, so much tighter, so the infiltration is really controlled. And then when you bring in the outside air, you have the ability to filter it to the level that you need. I mean, as long as your 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 fans can pull enough um, pressure drop across a the kind of filter you need to remove smoke. I think it's a really important point in how your buildings are designed. We, we don't have data and it frustrates the heck out of us. So what I'm about to say is just anecdotal from the last few smoke events, but the HRV filters fill up really fast. And we've had people try secondary filters or additional filters during smoke events based on just changing filters and talking to people, it seems like the best advice we can give at the moment is just get out there and have a bunch of extra filters you own and during smoke events, change them like every other day. And then just, it's, it's not adding more pressure drop, it's not adding more problems, you're just burning through filters fairly fast. But all you kind of have to do is take the filter out, show it to the residents of the building and say, right, this was otherwise in your house, in your lungs, are you willing to spend another $20 to filtered up for the two days, but the, the filters come up very, very, very fast. Um, and barring something else, that's kind of what we're urging people to do is whatever the maintenance schedule was for HRVs, have a bunch of extras, do them around every 48 hours while the event's active and then after, and then restart if you're on a three month or six month cycle, restart your cycle after the event. That seems like a great recommendation. Are there any uh, inherent contradictions in uh, ventilation rates and uh, compared to other types of systems? For instance, as we add more ventilation, we're also adding often more humidity to buildings and things like that, which in other words, how do we know that we're getting to the point where we cure one problem and then create three more problems, which is kind of classic building science world where we think we're being clever and we, all we do is 20 years from now, they're like, what, what were they thinking? So do you see any kind of any issues specific to like viral control compared to other aspects of air? Yeah, I mean, I think your point is really well taken, especially since, you know, what we're trying to do is get the energy use in buildings down because it's such a huge carbon footprint, right? So now all of a sudden, if we decide, well, we're just gonna increase that outdoor air ventilation you know, then our, then our energy use goes through the roof. Um, I think, I think it's, it's a problem we all need to work on. I think one way to think about it is, can, do we have the capacity to change the ventilation system 
to be appropriate for a particular problem. So if we, so in one hospital I worked in, you know, they, we were a, their HVAC system was designed so that we could alter it at a moment's notice and turn the ward that we were isolating into a negative pressure ward to hold, you know, 60 airborne isolated patients. And if we can maybe build in capacity for manipulating ventilation when we need it, that might be an interesting way to go. It's just an idea. Yeah. No, I mean, we've, we've sort of discussed that recently here too. The, the, the problem, the way we see it, is so if you think of the typical residential passive house where you like supply to a bedroom, it cascades through a hall and it comes out through a bathroom. You have these different zones and you, every zone gets the same air changes per hour, but the air, it comes in clean to the bedroom, a little bit dirtier in the hallway, dirtier in the bathroom, but it's on its way out the door. And that cascade system allows us the best, uh, the, the best opportunity to lower the overall ventilation rate. And it can scale up to a huge degree. So we're doing a very large student dormitory dining hall and kitchen where the exhaust out of the commercial kitchen is massive, but we're feeding into the dining area. You know, so the freshest air comes where people are sitting. The transfer zone is the servery, and you have sort of a little bit more polluted air there. Then it comes out through the servery into the kitchen and out the kitchen. Out. So you still have that cascade. What changes all that is as soon as you talk to a medical facility, they're like, no, under no circumstances do I want room from the hallway in the room or from one room in another room. Everything wants to be isolated. So their design requirements are not only high ventilation rates, but every room is supposed to supply an exhaust itself with no leakage to the hallway at all. Otherwise, they'd want to put in like a vestibule. And they want to, as, as Shelley said, pressurize or depressurize certain areas just because their absolute fear is that these droplets, I guess, or other particles transfer out of one room where one person is being cared for and enter some other space where a worker works or another person is being cared for. So what we see is driving up the ventilation rate is not only the requirement for more ventilation, but the absolute compartmentalization, which means many, many small spaces get complete supply and complete exhaust. And that factor alone can drive up the effective mechanical ventilation rate by many orders of magnitude. That's the tough part we don't know how to get at. And I don't see how we could do that in every building, although we absolutely want to do it in medical facilities. Well, I think your point of thinking about where the most common pollutants occur in a house or in a hospital or anywhere for that matter and then driving in the cleanest air and then um because what you yeah what you you want to make sure you have that airflow going from you know taking the emissions uh, you know out and passing it through the dirtier and dirtier parts and then taking the whole thing out i think that principle is really a good way to think about it Phil, you had a question about uh, kind of what the ASHRAE 62.2 standard is and how that's comparing to what we're talking about. Do you want to elaborate on the question? Uh, sure, yeah. Basically, I just was trying to see, I know we're talking passive house, but I think more in residential homes being, I, that, that's my primary work that I deal with. So I'm just trying to translate that in my mind. You know, what would we think the ideal ventilation rate would be in a, in a residential or even in a multifamily, you know, apartment type? type setting. I'm just trying to do that translation in my in my mind. Well, it depends on what you're ventilating for. I know that we were talking in our for occupants, webinar. basically just for occupant air. Yeah. So Yugo Lee was talking about 10 liters per second per person. And I don't know if that came from ASHRAE 622. I'm thinking it does for certain spaces. But in the grand scheme of things, a literature review has suggested that for health, we need to be ventilating more at about 25 liters per second per person. Mm -hmm. And that includes infectious diseases, sick building, um, cognitive function in schools, what have you. I mean, obviously on everybody's front of mind is, you know, what do we do with our own personal houses? And obviously we're trying to get that message out to as many builders as that's, you know, front of mind to people purchasing houses, you know, current clients, they're living in these houses. So just getting to what, what is the best recommendation for, for ventilation rate, you know, under the current circumstances with the, you know, current threat that we're all, we're all looking at. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Well, or, or didn't you, when we first met years ago, you were talking about how there's no money in the study. So we are, you know, we've been, all these standards have been pretty much based on somebody's back of the envelope guess for years and then elaborated upon, right? Like where does 62.2 come from? Yeah. You know, like there might, the answer might be where, where these standards came from and what we were measuring this whole time. Well, ASHRAE is a diff difficult application of, of a ventilation standard for health, honestly. It, you know, it's a, when, you, when they develop those standards, it's a compromise between uh, researchers and industry reps, right? So, for example, when I helped to develop the ventilation rate that we need on aircraft, you know, we had to fight with Boeing to say, you know, they didn't want us to ventilate to the standard we wanted. And you can't get anywhere until you compromise. So, you know, we came down in our recommendations and they went up in their desires. And so that's the compromise. So I'm not sure you're getting the best uh, information and in ASHRAE standards for health. You're getting something that everyone can agree on. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other thing that's been illustrated by the, the debate and the swings in metrics over the last few ASHRAE standards is that flow rate alone is not a sufficient metric to tell you how healthy your ventilation is. And we've always focused on flow rate and ASHRAE has kind of tripped over itself repeatedly around that question. Um, for example, over the years, they, as kitchens became more open plan, they said you need this kitchen ventilation rate for the entire space. But when you had single family homes where the, basically the entire main floor is one big open room, do you count the entire main floor to be ventilated at the kitchen rate? It quickly becomes absurd. And yet they were, they were trying to extend that notion that of uh, point source control, that you, you're, the reason you have different ventilation in the pitch, kitchen is you have these point sources, but they weren't looking at kind of where's the hood, what's the hood capture efficiency, how far is the hood from things, all of these other pieces that um, you can have a lower flow rate with great control and achieve better ventilation than a massive flow rate on a really high ceiling intake that's, you know, 15 feet up there or something. Secondly, if you're really going to look at ventilation, as Shelly noted, you have to look at that filtration. What's coming into your air? Are you filtering what's coming in and controlling it? And are you filtering as things move around the house and controlling that to some degree? Um, again, I think that the quickest short definition now is filtered, balanced ventilation with a, a network in your house that controls making sure every room gets something so you don't have those under ventilated rooms that create the problems. The classic example that was cited here is the crappy restaurant bathroom is probably where most diseases are possibly mm -hmm. spread. It has no ventilation whatsoever, but it has one of those hand blowers. So it makes sure that any germs that are introduced are quickly blown throughout the entire unventilated room as much as possible. That would be what you don't want to do. Hey, Jeremy, may I ask a, a, a question? Yeah, filter question. I do. Yeah. Um, Hi. Hi. Uh, I was curious if there is any consensus about whether central furnace integrated systems versus exhaust only systems are providing overall better indoor air quality. Is that in the context of a just a basic home or in the? Yes, in like a typical American home where those seem to be the. Com most common systems yeah the I think the the one piece of evidence that I was that alerted me to maybe being slightly concerned about exhaust only systems was some data I saw from my colleague who showed that in an exhaust only system that there was seemed to be more formaldehyde in the air coming into the building because it was being right. drawn through the building shell and then exhaust it. Um, and I thought that was kind of an interesting study. So I would prefer, you know, I don't know, I would prefer, they're doing a study right now on the, in, Cal in California, on the new uh, standard they have for home building, which where you either have to have a dedicated system or exhaust only. So they're looking at the air, indoor air quality on 
those kinds of systems to see which one's better. Thank you. Okay. Okay, go, go ahead, Chairman. Yes. Hi, so um, very interesting what you're saying. Um, so we just finished the house. Uh, uh, Can you speak up? We uh, just finished off. a passive house here in, in Toronto, in Canada. Can you hear me? A little yes. bit. Okay, hold on, maybe. Yeah, no, it's clear. Right now? Yeah, that's better, okay. So um, super interesting what you're talking about. Um, we just finished uh, a house here in Toronto, Ontario, and um, the client is very um, has a lot of uh, uh, health issues. So there are two things. First of all, we didn't want to use um, fiberglass because of the formaldehyde content. And I think what you, I would be very interested to to check uh, the research uh, you're talking about because it basically says that you know if you put materials that um, emit formaldehyde and you don't ventilate properly you're actually getting all of it so that's interesting one thing um but my question is uh, so we we did entire design with an hrv and the client was stubborn about using a hepa filter uh, and we couldn't place the hepa filter on the hrv so we have to add it up and we lost um uh, pressure, so we need to add a boost mode, uh, uh, all to use the HEPA filter. We did uh, some research and tried to convince her that there are other filters that are as good or or good enough, but there was no, um, we didn't have um, a good um, um, data or, 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 or article or something to convince her that, you know, there's some other filters that are not uh, as efficient as HEPA, but are as good for you to avoid, uh, you know, uh, having um, some um, um, your allergies, basically. Uh, so I don't know if you have done something like that, or you can uh, talk about uh, different type of filters and if you had um, some research on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing, I guess the way I think about filtration is if you're doing a single pass filtration, which is typically what you're doing in uh, a whole house ventilation system is just drawing air in and passing it once through the filter. You do want to try to put the most efficient filter in there you can. Uh, and I have seen that, you know, Electret or there are some enhanced filters that are, that that are very efficient, but they have lower pressure drop. When you're thinking about an air cleaner in a space, you can drop the efficiency of the filter quite a bit and still get the same performance because you're operating it in a recirculating mode. So, you know, if it's a recirculating type system, then a lower efficiency filter works just fine. But if it's a single pass, you do want a higher filter. And there have been studies showing that, you know, if you don't change these filters often enough, you uh, you have poor air quality because there's there's some studies showing perceived air quality decreases even when you bring air in across a filter and it's a clean filter and it's especially bad when it's a dirty filter. So maintaining those filters is important for sensitive people in, in homes, I would say. Lindsay, natural builder. Can we get onto the topic of materiality as well and indoor uh, contamination? Is Lindsay gone? She's Lindsay, here. Yeah. I'll unmute her. I, I wanted, yeah, so Lindsay I, wanted. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Lindsay just wanted to ask about uh, material materials, uh, specifically around "quote unquote" natural materials or actual natural materials compared to plastics or other kind of more uh, processed or chemical. I, I shouldn't say chemical, everything is chemical based, but you know, more uh, synthetic materials. And mm -hmm. what you're seeing as far as the impact on that, you know, indoor air qualities. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I would say um, right now, the way I'm thinking about environmental contaminants in buildings is by looking at six major classes of toxic chemicals and they include plastics, uh, flame retardants, highly fluorinated chemicals for waterproofing or stain resistance, and um, metals and um, um, antimicrobials, for example, and solvents. You know, so solvents in building materials are quite common because of the glues and the paints and the, um, you know, so we even had 
high VOC concentrations in a passive house we measured when they did some reno renovations. They did a renovation and our total volatile organic compound went way up and then came back down after a while because of all the solvents you have in building materials. So I think looking at the solvents that you have and then whether your materials are you know, waterproofed or stain resistant and then looking for hidden sources of flame retardants in your furniture and plastics. These are the kinds of uh, toxic chemicals that I'm focusing on right now in indoor spaces. Is it so it's pretty complex, like there's no like one major class that is spread pretty, there's a whole bunch of different sources? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different sources and I'll enter into the chat screen the, um, the website that I rely on to, to help me figure out where these toxic chemicals are lurking in your space and in what material. It's called sixclasses.org and they help you understand where you might find um, you know one of these highly chlorinated chemicals for example you can find highly chlorinated chemicals in um, your floss that you use to clean your teeth you can find antimicrobials in your toothpaste if you're not careful you can find phthalates in your um, your detergent that you wash your clothes with so, you know, these toxic chemicals are lurking in all sorts of products and that we use in our space. And so, you know, trying to educate yourself on what the potential sources are, I would say start with sixclasses.org. Okay, questions. Come on, guys, this is... I can also um, share with you a little bit about uh, I put together some slides on cooking if anyone's interested in cooking stuff. Sure, please. I think yep. we, yeah, okay. Uh, let me just share a little bit about cooking um, and then I will, we should be good. I just wanted to remind everybody what the health based studies are on cooking emissions. We do have numerous epidemiological studies over the past 40 years to show especially an association between the use of gas for cooking compared to electricity and respiratory symptoms. So I wanted to point out that nitrogen dioxide is generated when you cook with gas and it's been associated with higher respiratory symptoms including asthma in children. And in this particular study, for example, they found you know, five parts per million more mean NO2 in gas stove homes compared to the overall observations in the study. And they had about 4,000 observations in this study, so pretty significant. Um, we're also no we also know that nitrogen dioxide increases mortality and carbon monoxide is generated. And we found in a recent study, there was a lot of low level carbon monoxide in many homes, we think due to all the pilot lights in the homes. Uh, we don't know the uh, impacts on health of low level exposure long term to carbon monoxide, but we know that elevated exposure can quickly, uh, quickly cause significant health effects. Also, um, PM2.5 and ultrafine particles are significant are significantly generated by cooking. And we know that causes respiratory disease and death. So I wanted to point out this data from 2013 where they looked at nitrogen dioxide in gas stoves and found that the concentrations of NO2 in those homes were on the higher end compared to all subjects. And that the odds ratio increases linearly with nitrogen dioxide concentrations for rescue, med rescue medication use, for example. Um, this study was super interesting because all it looked at was turning on your gas stove, that's it. And then they monitored nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen, nitric oxide, and particulate number concentrations, which is a proxy for ultrafine particles. And these pollutants were very readily transmitted between your kitchen and your bedroom. So here's a roasting episode at, uh, in the morning, and you can see that as the kitchen elevates, so does the bedroom. Uh, we also found elevated levels of these pollutants from cooking, from cooktops, from turning on the roaster, and the oven. And this wasn't even 
you know, adding food to your processing. This was just turning on your gas stove. Um, here is some data showing also different cooking uh, emissions. I like the study on the left, which used a whole bunch of different types of oils because oils can generate different pollutant levels. So the top, um, the top graph is PM 2.5 concentrations, and we find that the highest PM 2.5 is actually for olive at low temperatures, um, at high temperatures, sorry, and that we find you know, for example, safflower oil and soybean oil, which are oils I don't commonly use anymore. So I have to let my dog go. Come on. And, um, and then on the right, there's a, another piece of data showing the mixing between the kitchen and the living room. And that um, when you start cooking, uh, the concentrations are much higher in the kitchen compared to the living room, but that it is still increasing throughout your house. Um, this is a study that was recently done by the um, home chems, and what, what was super interesting about this study is they were able to break down the emissions quite, uh, with quite, resolution, quite a lot of resolution, looking at you know, breakfast and different processes. Um, and so I just wanted to share that information with you. And this data shows, you know, cooking a Thanksgiving dinner, basically, where you have this huge emission of, from cooking. You're, um, you're removing the Brussels sprouts from the oven, for example. You just don't know what's going to create pollution in your home. So, of course, the technology right now for removing cooking emissions is these kitchen exhaust hoods. We did a passive house study showing that you know if you don't have a hood, then you have you can even have elevated concentra concentrations of particles in different passive houses depending on what your what your ventilation look like. The houses that we studied had this enhanced ventilation, so you could turn on a boost and your your out outdoor air supply would go up but it was in your, you know, right in your kitchen space. And so, for example, here in Passive House 106, when the boost mode went on, the mass concentration of PM 2.5 went up, um, despite the fact that it's supposed to actually help with, the, with diluting your cooking exhaust. Um, and here we find PM 2.5 concentr concentrations stay elevated for a very long time while cooking without kitchen exhaust. Meaning, for example, in Passive House 107, the time above 35 micrograms per cubic meter, which is the EPA standard for health, was you know eight hours. Um, so, a couple of things we've looked at with uh, kitchen exhaust is that when you cook on the back burner, your effectiveness is much higher. It's 97% removal than if you cook on the front burner. So that's kind of a cool observation. Uh, so the, the back burner is the key. Um, and then using a high flow exhaust to outside will also significantly reduce it. So here's 146 liters per second hood compared to a 36 liters per second hood. Um, so I think I'll just stop there and see if there's anything else you want to talk about with regards to that kind of information. I have a question that goes back to the first section, but it has it's one of those one of those things that I had not actually focused on before our distancing habits now. So we're still not on lockdown here. We are allowed to uh, move around. We're, we're to stay home, but we're also allowed to go out. And sometimes you're out and you can't really avoid passing somebody. The question is, how does, for example, I won't say COVID distrib uh, uh, coronavirus distribution, but in general, droplet distribution compare to smoke and odor distribution? Because sometimes I can I can detect, for example, is is the is the distribution of the smell of somebody smoking similar to the distribution of the droplets? 
You know, I think of our back of the envelope kind of understanding, because I'm concerned in short range and even long range transport of, of aerosols and um, inhalable respirable particles, I would say it's, you know, it's a pretty good proxy. Smoke is a pretty good proxy for the kinds of aerosols that we generate and then that stay airborne and that then can be transported into your space and you can inhale them. So if you can smell the, 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 the cigarette smoke, you're basically also inhaling whatever is being spewed. Yeah. I mean, it's some data I saw today on a webinar was showing that, you know, the particle sizes that contain virus were around 1.5 microns, and they hardly sampled any, anything at all above 5 microns. And, you know, it, smoke does have, you know, is a fine aerosol around that same size range. So, you know, I think it's a reasonable proxy. And that means that it's carried aloft in the same way? Mm -hmm. In other yeah. words, somebody's smoking uh, down the cor at the corner and you can detect the smell 30 yards, 20 yards away. Does that also mean that the particles are being carried in the same, in the same sort of a plume? Yeah, I mean, the fine particles can stay aloft for, you know, for on the order of hour, you know, so, uh, you know, the transport um, tens of minutes to hours are what, you know, those kinds of one to two micron size, we can do some physics calculation to figure that out. Uh, but they stay, we, we tend to think they stay a lot for, you know, on the order of tens of minutes to an hour in the air. So yeah, they could just be like, floating around <laughs> that's why we want you know we keep saying hush in this infection crisis we need to dilute with ventil you know clean air so we can get the those concentrations down so we don't infect other people but are are our noses more sensitive so that the smell for example of cigarette smoke might be detected but the concentration of virus droplets might not be yeah i don't think i, I haven't seen anything um you know and sm cigarette smoke is a very complex mixture of 2000 plus chemicals right semi-volatile organic compounds and volatile organic compounds and particles and you know so it's very complex so the odor is you know both related to the particles and the gases uh, you know, but thinking about how uh, how small the particles are when you talk and breathe, you can generate small particles as well as large particles, which fall out of the air pretty quickly. Uh, I think envisioning how smoke travels is kind of useful for the non aerosol scientist type of person. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of shocked at that that Chinese restaurant slide you showed of all those tables starting from that first patient there and that 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 recirculation of air is definitely like where it comes looks like it's a compounder like our hvac systems or typical air conditioning systems are compounders of that air air natural air so aer, aerosolization that's probably that word but the aerosol itself is is actually like almost every commercial space i can think of has a recirculating ventilation system so you know, we it's six feet becomes fairly meaningless that you're just really mixing it up at, at that level, it seems. Like it seems yeah. like a good, like an outside, it makes sense. But inside, I'm not feeling so secure shopping tomorrow for groceries. <laughs> well, I think it's the air currents, right? It, I mean, it doesn't take much to blow, you know, a, a fine particle from my table to your table. So, you know, having these you know, fairly strong air currents from an air conditioning system in a small space can really drive those aerosols to a different location. Um, I don't know if you can feel, I didn't, you know, there wasn't much information about it, but in a, in a, in a big grocery store, I tend to think maybe that there'll be more entrainment 
as you walk by a person, you know, the airflow will, will be entrained more than, than probably any velocity from the HVAC. Okay. That's good to so, know that. So hold, your, so hold your breath when you're walking past somebody. I kind of do, actually, right now. I just, yeah, that's been my strategy, weirdly I enough. I do, and I, um, I usually recommend, you know, if you're in air, pollute, air polluted and a polluted environment to breathe through your nose because your nose is a natural filter. But I read some data recently that was explaining that some of the receptors that, that mitigate or that cause the infection to happen, like the virus is attracted to these, to these receptors and there's a lot of them in your nose. Oh. So it kind of made me think, Oh, there's more of those receptors in my nose than in my throat and my lungs. And so if I'm inhaling through my nose, there's, that's maybe not the best idea. I thought that was kind of an interesting thought. I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lise. I work in Vancouver in, um, and I work in um, policy, a lot to do with climate climate policy. I'm not a building technical specialist. And so I'm trying to just uh, put some of these pieces together. And hopefully this, I can come up with a coherent question. But thank you so much. It's super interesting. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of building electrification. And so I think the piece around the gas cooking is super important and something I'm trying to dig into. Um, I've been trying to think about ways to tell the story and link, uh, you know, action on climate change with um, energy efficiency and building electrification and for example um, for resilience around say and you were talk, speaking about wildfire smoke events so in my mind you know if we're if we have a better um, building envelope and better air tightness uh, that can enable us to then purif better purify filter the air that's coming in um, and create you know a, a stronger case for for higher performing buildings from that angle um, and then but I feel like I'm, I'm kind of struggling with the indoor air quality piece I mean the electrification makes sense um, but you know how do how do we balance the risks from the outdoor air and the air pollution um, including smoke events, but also just the ambient air pollution we're dealing with in the cities with the, uh, the need to um, exchange air uh, from the indoor air pollution side. And so, yeah, uh, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. And I'm just wondering if there's, if, if any of you have a way to kind of link some of these pieces together to try to tell that story about uh, energy efficiency indoor air quality, health, and climate, um, kind of in, in a package. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot of people on the call who could speak to that, so I'm not gonna say much, but I do think, you know, the first key is to get your gas appliances out of your home, so I'm really excited about your electrification idea. And then, you know, to think about uh, tried and true air cleaning technologies that need to be used only when your outside air is contaminated uh, or your, you know, so for example, you know, filtration with um, a carbon filter for ozone and NOx and VOCs, a HEPA filter or a particle filter. And then you can use UV for outside, you know, issues with pollen and other types of allergens. What does other people think about that? So I do think it, uh, there are many, many things that Passive Health still needs to um, discuss further. Um, electrification certainly is something positive uh, from what you presented by the cascading ventilation, which is something that Monty um, kind of explained before. I think that's something that we, we also have to um, evaluate uh, especially for for this situation of uh, transmission of how how safe or non safe those might be um, so that's kind of my my comment in regards to that I, I would say that one of the bigger issues is controlled ventilation is more 
effective than uncontrolled ventilation, as in infiltration. And especially when you're dealing with the concern about exterior pollutants coming in, I think that's where Passive House is, is shines because by the same token that the noise control works, it's also keeping out the ants and mice and keeping out the uh, exterior pollutants, except through the ventilation system, but there you could control it. And the conversation earlier about, about the problem with smoke events, which I find fascinating, we had a job in uh, Jackson, Wyoming a few years ago, and just around that time, there were these fire events, and we were we were chasing our tails, trying to make sure that we were approaching that correctly. How do you ventilate for indoor air pollutants when the outdoor air is the problem? And I guess that the answer that I'm coming away with from what you were saying, Shelley, is that when these situations happen, having recirculating filtration specific to the pollutants may be the, the solution. That is, in the rooms, in the spaces, have the recirculation filtra recirculating filtration that specifically deals with the indoor pollutants. And you bring in the fresh air so that you don't have CO2 accumulation, for example. I think that's great. I think that's a great um, summary of, of the key points there. And just to kind of further that, uh, we had a talk last year in Los Angeles about how they want to place, you know, kind of their, just as Monty was referring to, they're, they're putting in the denser housing along the busy streets. And then Los Angeles County at least was saying, well, we can't put low income housing near our freeways because that's a pollution source. I'm like, well, you're LA, that's all you are, are freeways. <laughs> so you're going to create these little teeny pockets of buildable spaces. So yeah, I think it, it's an opportunity for us in the building science community to come up with solutions where we can actually take the air that's a polluting source that's not going to go away because tires are a pollution source as well as exhaust. Even if we have all electric cars, we still have a tremendous amount of pollution source. How can we take it and make these buildings as purifiers for the environment? That we take air in, we clean it, and the air that comes out of our buildings it's cleaner than the air that comes in these buildings and that the buildings can block the freeways and that we can create a fensible space between that and the parks or, or schools from the freeways, things like that. Like we should start seeing these as, a, as opportunities perhaps on a bigger picture rather than just kind of like whack-a-mole, which it feels right. We're still in the whack-a-mole phase, it feels like, just because we have data sets floating all over the place and conflicting interests and things like that. So that was kind of, I want to throw that out to them to think that we should stop thinking about design as a as solve it as kind of trying to reduce problems, but actually solving problems and making a better kind of environment for people in the future. So that's uh, kind of where I'd love to see passive house or these high, higher these kind of data sets collect in the sense that we can create environments that actually purify air rather than reduce risk. You know, that's it just isn't appealing to reduce risk to a client to you know make their lives better and make lives of people around them better seems like a interesting proposition to me so i wanted to just say a few words about the filtration technology uh i like i want to encourage people to stick with things that are known to be effective and to not be drawn into the newest latest and greatest indoor air quality product uh, because it's a rampant space for bad design and bad products, <laughs> meaning, you know, we know activated carbon works for ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and volatile organic compounds. We know uh, particle filters, fiber filters work great for particles. We don't usually um, like ionizers. They can generate ozone quite efficiently. Uh, you know, I don't like anything with electricity in it. I have used electrostatic precipitators, but they have to be cleaned regularly. And otherwise, you know, anything with electricity can spark and cause ozone. Um, so, you know, I keep always seeing these latest and greatest 
device and I'm thinking that's just another ozone generator. Could you just stop it? It makes me crazy. <laughs> Or a good skeptical crowd, so I'll spread mm -hmm. the word. I, I had a quick question. Um, with these smaller air particles, and uh, you know, a lot of the houses now, folks want taller ceilings, um, and having ventilation up high, are you encouraging those air particles to stay afloat with, with that? Or um, is it more about just bringing more air in and venting it out faster to try to mix up the air more? I mean, I think for general air quality, indoor air quality improvements, you want to bring in the air and mix it in the space to take out all of the pollution that has already been diluted in your space and take it out. So I worry about inlets being too high and then the air not, not mixing because of the temperature stratification or something that's going on. Uh, but you know, for if there's going to be a really localized source, then you have to have a dedicated system to that local source so it doesn't get mixed into the general environment. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have any sense for how much uh, print? Now we're many more when many more people working at home. Uh, it used to be that laser printers were suspect because they generated ozone. Do we still see printers as being an issue or do the, does the ink, inkjet technology do not contribute that way? I think the more significant problem with printers is the 3D printers we now all have, or many people have in their indoor spaces. And they generate a lot, they can generate a lot of toxic emissions and need to be specifically ventilated. Um, they generate some, a lot of VOCs and a lot of fine particles. So have, those are the printers that I have my eyes on the most, you know, people putting them in schools and homes and not ventilating them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. So what would you like to see in the future kind of where we should be focusing on on generally is from a design point of view for just implementation of products and technologies? What's your wish list? Well, I think you've done a great job at, um, you know, at the ventilation design. I'd love to see some, you know, require, you know, I, I don't know where you are with the kitchen exhaust right now, but I know that you were working pretty hard on that to make sure that that was that was addressed so making sure you know every passive house have has a dedicated way to remove cooking emissions we're groaning about that one still so yeah sorry yeah. but y'all are super smart i know you can figure it out <laughs> and then you know i would say focus on getting the toxic materials out of your buildings because the building is tight and i know you're providing good ventilation but i i do think there is some in every home some you know a real need to focus on getting those toxic materials out and identifying where they are it's difficult but i i am hoping that that can be you know a significant push for the future in other words don't invite the problem everybody ready to go to bed yeah Oh, it's you could better day. ventilate your, building, your bedrooms also in a passive house. I just want to put that out there. So, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I was kind of shocked at our carbon dioxide from your study for our bedroom. Yeah. So, yeah. Otherwise, what I also really love is that you're pushing the price point down so that, you know, we can use them for low-income projects and school dorms and other other applications of this kind of technology. I think that's wonderful. And I really appreciate your concern with indoor air quality and, and really thanks for having me um, online. And, and I hope that I shared enough that was intriguing, but informational as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Shelly. And uh, you talk a little bit about the building behind you, the, the virtual building behind you. Uh, that is my that is the engineering center at CU Boulder. If you haven't seen it, it's 
it's kind of infamous for either you love it or you hate it. And I think Andrew actually loves it, but most, most people who see it uh, actually hate it. <laughs> it's a classic 70s design, right, Andrew? Yeah, it's kind of a, it has kind of a uh, Colorado brutalist interpretation of brutalist architecture, but yes, brutalism itself is quite... Yeah. No, if they were trying to mimic, um, I was just going to pull up this one, this particular um, view in, uh, I feel like they were trying to do that <laughs> with a building, you know. What's your but, feeling of the building? Yeah, there's so many more, there's so many nice buildings that see you. It doesn't have any windows, like two little windows, so that's very brutalist as well. So Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Does anybody else have anything they want to share or ask? Or mm -hmm. right, uh, thank thank you so much. It was great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks thank for the invite. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody, thank for coming. You. Thank you. Oh, let me do a quick, uh, before we cut off, let me do a quick announcement. Uh, John Fassler here is sitting in his room. I just unmuted him. He's going to be our next, and this is a good segue, actually, into next month's presentation, which is on. Uh, on how to test air tightness for a passive house and strategies around envelope uh, design and just the protocols of of uh, testing and i'm babbling on john anything you want to add to that no i i, I would say uh, i've, I've uh, tested a couple of passive houses recently for air tightness and had some struggles with software and uh, so I've, I've learned a lot so now i'm ready to share that and uh, if anybody has any uh, anything they want to know about uh, specifically air tightness testing uh, for Passive House, uh, shoot me an email or let me know. And uh, you can contact me through Andrew if you don't have my information. Uh, I can address that uh, next month. And fun fact, as far as I know, that's the only thing we actually test on specific projects in Passive House. I don't know if anybody knows of anything else that we test on right now, but that's the big one. So usually it's the one that makes people most nervous as well. Well, the ventilation commissioning. Needs oh, that's to be true. That's true, Ken. Yeah. I on top I, of the evening. I was, I was giving you plenty of room to fill that. Anything else that we got? the So it's all around air, basically air control from between ventilation and air tightness. So, you know, all kind of plays together, it seems.